Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's session. My name is Mark Donner. I'm a senior manager with the Environmental Innovation Team at Alberta Innovates. This is the third webinar in the 2023 Water Innovation Webinar Series. I would like to take a moment today to respectfully acknowledge that we are coming to you virtually from Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territory and Métis Regions 3 and 4 in Alberta. I will highlight that the reach of this work and its activities influence and are influenced by all treaty territory and all Métis regions in Alberta, not just those from which we're coming to you today. This acknowledgement respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all Indigenous peoples of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. For those of you not familiar, Alberta Innovates is a provincial corporation created to support research and innovation activities. We provide funding programs, advice, connections, technical expertise, and applied research services. Our scope encompasses the whole innovation journey from applied R&D through to commercialization and end use. This includes science informing policy and practices. Water innovation webinars share ideas and outcomes from projects funded through Alberta Innovates Water Innovation Program and highlight other important water initiatives within the province. I hope this session will provide you with some valuable information and spark discussion. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many questions as we can after we hear from all the speakers. This session chat box is a useful tool to connect with other participants. I would encourage you to use the tool to discuss the session topic, but please don't let it distract you from the presentations. With that, I would like to welcome everyone to the Alberta Innovates Water Innovation, Web Water Innovation Webinar. Today's topic is titled Using Isotopes to Study Climate-Related Changes in Our Water Resources. The impacts of climate change can be clearly seen in our water resources. In Alberta, water quality is changing and water supply is more variable and increasingly uncertain due to extreme weather events. Stable isotopes, isotopes have been used to investigate water balance processes and the relationships between hydrology, vegetation, and ecosystems. These tools can help build an accurate baseline of water resources to better understand potential future states. Uh, so this webinar brings together four researchers who are using isotopes in different ways to characterize how climate change is affecting our water. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Trisha Stadnick, Professor and Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary, Francisco Castro Munoz, Senior Researcher, Environmental Services at Innotech Alberta, Dr. John Gibson, Principal Researcher, Environmental Services, also at Innotech Alberta, and Dr. Bernhard Mayer, Professor, University of Calgary. All right, with that, we can get started. So, uh, Tricia, you are first up. Um, if you'd like to unmute and start sharing your presentation. Sure, can you hear me okay? Hopefully. Yes, you're good to go. All right. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Tricia Stadnick from the University of Calgary Hydrological Analysis Lab and a professor and Canada Research Chair in the Schulich School of Engineering. Uh, so global climate change, as many of us have already uh been aware of is increasingly altering the hydroclimatic responses um, in, in the hydrologic landscape beyond the range that is generally considered to be predictably possible from our hydro hydrometeorological records alone. That is, the observations just don't simply capture the kinds of extremes that we're seeing. Water resource practitioners are often therefore increasingly reliant on new methods of modeling hydrological change. Um, and a few key problems and barriers to the uptake of some new modeling advances exist. Um, one that I'd like to discuss is shown here, which is the um, data availability issue. Um, then we'll talk about on the next slide as well. Uh, Non-stationarity, which is that the records simply don't capture the, the trends and the trend analysis tools that we have are extending beyond the stationarity issue, which means they're no longer applicable to us. Uh, and large scale heterogeneity. So when we look at the things as a wa whole watershed scale, things are changing so rapidly that some of the modeling methods and tools that we have aren't able to capture the actual changes that we see. And this has a compounding causation uh, and multifactorial effect on our ability to accurately predict the extremes. Okay, so Consider uh, observations of extreme flows that we use for flood frequency analysis as an example. And these are the same kinds of observations that we use to calibrate our models. 
Here uh, we see significant differences between selecting what we consider to be the AMAX flow series, which is the annual maximum flows, and that's shown in blue, from the instantaneous peak flow or the IMAX series, which is shown um, in orange and is captured from five minute gauge recordings. Uh, there's often greater than 10% difference between the IMAX and AMAX observations of extreme flows. Um, and typically speaking, the IMAX is um, always greater than the AMAX. Normally, what we calibrate our models to is the annual uh, time series of flows or the AMAX series. Uh, another issue that we have globally are record links. Uh, this gauge in particular has data from 1945 to present, which represents a typical to actually longer period of record in Canada. Uh, the mean is about 50 years, actually. And when we apply the rule of 2T, or two times the return period for flood frequency analysis on our observations, this means that if we're um, estimating one in 25 year event, we need at least um, 50 years of record. And so for large water infrastructure, which we typically design to 100 or a 200 year return period, we simply don't have enough observations to accurately um, simulate that and model it. Furthermore, if we examine the hydrometric network design, then we find that the majority of the gauges in the world uh, for hydrometric data are in fact focused at regional scales. So between about 1,000 and 10,000 square kilometers. Um, and this is actually um, taken from a report from the World Bank for the uh, World Hydrometeorologic Observing System. Um, and essentially, this is, of course, driven by the need for operational data. So these gauges are installed mostly for flood forecasting purposes and to gather information that could be used for, for predicting flows that would be important uh, to move people and mobilize resources. From a modeling perspective, however, this uh, results in operations preferentially uh, selecting lumped type models to, that run more efficiently at these larger scales uh, than distributed and uh, detailed hydrologic models where we simply don't have enough data oftentimes to calibrate the level of complexity that those models have. But do, what do we miss when we actually turn to lumped models? And this is a very complicated graphic, but I'll try to break it down for you here. Well, local scale heterogeneity and connectivity between hydrologic storages and fluxes does tend to get averaged out across larger scales or watersheds. It is precisely these process scale changes that remain critical as early warning tools for climate change and that are critical for generating peak flows that we need for understanding the effects of climate change on the hydrologic cycle. Shown here is the Athabasca River watershed at about 160,000 square kilometers. And there's different process sensitivities represented by the different colors and the little pie charts that you see for each hydrometric gauge within the basin. Um, there's significant differences in the sensitivity of the model to specific processes as you move from the headwaters at the upstream. You see here it's dominated by glacial melt. That makes sense because of the Athabasca ice fields. Um, moving towards the mid basin, then it becomes dominated by soil storage processes and retention. And as we move further downstream, then you become more dominated by evaporation and sometimes snowmelt type processes. Um, so the question is, what do we care about in the model and what are we willing to sacrifice if we model this entire basin as one lump system and kind of find an overall average, which is shown by the basin mean here. The basin mean can be highly different than the individual sensitivities of processes and importance of those processes at specific gauges. What's happening here is the model and the processes are responding to changes in climate, land use cover, soils, and, and other aspects that are changing. So the larger that the basin gets, the more diverse and heterogeneous it gets, and there's really no one size fits all picture. So the takeaway here is that we need complicated yet efficient models that will provide us accurate predictions of extremes and changing processes for operational decision making. And this is where large scale tracer aided modeling can actually help us because it provides additional data and provides feedback to the models that can help us to constrain some of these uh, process based predictions. So how can uh, some of the advances in tracer aided modeling help us to uh, predict extremes under a change in climate. 
So starting with a recap of what I mean by large-scale tracer-aided modeling, essentially it adds a computational step or function that tracks not only the water balance, but the mass exchange for every single storage and flux within a hydrologic model. So every time water is moved as a flux, mass is moved as well. And the isotopes are a useful tool because they are conservative and only change under the influence of evaporation or mixing of different sources. This helps us to specifically track storages that are affected by changing changes as a result of things like evaporation. We can improve model calibration and validation by using tracer-aided simulation in a couple of ways. First of all, we're improving the amount of data that's available to the model. So instead of calibrating to stream flow alone, we can calibrate to stream flow and the stream flow isotopic signature if we collect that from the river water, but we can also grab samples from the environment such as wetland complexes or soil storages or precipitation. And we can use those to constrain the model at the process level rather than at the final summative step of where it generates and routes stream flow. Um, so in particular, this is a code that my group uh, develops and we're currently, it's available on GitHub and we're currently making it uh, a model agnostic version that can plug in with any different hydrologic model. Um, and we've already uh, implemented this code within HYPE, which is the Swedish Meteorologic and Hydrologic Institute model. Okay, so... In terms of directing individual hydrologic model calibration, we can compare and contrast model evaluation and an output that is calibrated to streamflow only versus that that is calibrated by both streamflow and isotopes, which is helpful to us. The bottom left shows a hydrograph of an output from a, a calibrated model that was in blue optimized only to the stream flow versus in purple and this reddish pink color optimized to both flow and isotopes. And really what we take away from this is there are insignificant differences in the quality and accuracy of the total flow simulation. So uh, there was no change detected no matter how we calibrated the model in terms of stream flow. But if we move to the top right, despite there being insignificant differences in stream flow, internally within the model, there can actually be very large differences in terms of where that water's going and where it's being stored. The radar plots, um, each corner represents a different storage compartment within the model controlled by different parameters. The left one is from the flow only calibration here. So the one that I'm circling or plot A. Um, and essentially it's showing that it's dominated by one process with quite a bit of uncertainty as shown by the gray bands uh, and then two other processes, which really are indicating um, a difference from when we add the isotopes to the calibration. It's almost completely opposite where the water is stored in a completely different place in the model and different processes are controlling the flow response. And so this should be concerning to us as modelers because we don't see any difference in the total flow simulation, yet internally what's happening in the model is entirely different under these two scenarios. We've also taken a look at the cost of increasing model complexity by adding isotopes to calibration. Uh, and we can actually achieve near equal model streamflow performance, which is very important from an operations or practitioner point of view. And so this is showing the KGE of flow, which is a metric that we use. The maximum value is one um, versus the KGE of oxygen 18. Again, the best value is one. Um, this is for a basin though where we have fairly limited data and a large scale, so we wouldn't expect to get KGEs of one in this case, but you can see that the best fit would be the top right corner here, um, also represented by the green shaded areas. When we calibrate with both flow and isotopes, so shown as the purple dots, then we can achieve uh, the maximum stream flow performance as well as the maximum isotope performance. However, uh, if we calibrate only to stream flow, shown as these blue or cyan dots, we do achieve a slightly higher KGE of flow, but at the expense of a pretty terrible isotope simulation, which means we're really not putting the water in the right compartments and we're not evaporating enough from the model or storing enough in the soil. 
Um, what is also interesting here is we ran a scenario where we pretended that we didn't have any flow data and we calibrated the model only using isotope data and then checked at how well it performed in terms of flow. And so this would be a scenario where we've got isotope data in an ungauged basin. And you can see that, the, you know, it's not the greatest, but it does perform well isotopically and it gives us a KGE value that is decent and respectable for large scale modeling. And so these isotopes also offer potential for predictions in ungauged basins. And though there may not be significant differences in total stream flow prediction in the short term, so this top graph here is showing the peak flow estimation relative to the observed, which is the um, black dots with the error bars representing the uncertainty in the observed record. Um, when we run that exact, those exact same calibrated models, optimized only to stream flow and then optimized with both isotopes and stream flow, um, and we run that into the future, uh, out to specifically here, 2070, then we start to see a separation of those different calibrations. And specifically, the model that's uh, optimized with both the flow and the isotopes is the only one that really captures uh, a larger range of extreme flows. Now, that's important because if you check out this historical observed point here, this is a 2017 flood that occurred in this basin. It didn't occur until after we did this study, but you can see that the model was grossly under predicting the maximum extreme. So we do believe that models in general, when they're calibrated to stream flow only, are tending to under predict extreme flows. So water balance is really the canary in the coal mine, and it's going to be going to respond to climate change earlier than streamflow. Evaluating models by streamflow alone might yield high accuracy, a high KGE score, but it can result in low model fidelity. Basically, the isotopes, isotopes are better tuned to detecting process-based changes from non-stationarity, and they see things that the streamflow doesn't. So when we add that to our calibration process, we're more likely to calibrate those kinds of scenarios and process combinations that lead to extreme flows. So we need to ask ourselves, what are our models actually good for and what is needed from the modeling community in terms of moving forward and how can isotopes help? Isotopes specifically can help us to address the predictions to operations gap. Shown here is a quote from an excerpt of Kenneth Arrow when working on the month ahead weather forecast during the Second World War. And it's basically saying that the commanding general is well aware that the forecasts are no good. However, we need them for planning purposes. So just like the commanding general here, we need models and predictions of extremes for uh, actual operational purposes. So despite the fact that they're not perfect, we know we need to rely on them. So how can we improve them? Improving the representativeness of the models requires us to think broader and more holistically. We need to connect the various systems that uh, examine the cumulative effects of climate change. So how the climate and the land use changes affect the hydrology, but then how the human intervention, such as the regulation also affects the hydrology and how that trickles down to looking at ecological thresholds within the river. This requires us to add even more processes and more complexity to our modeling chain in which we know for sure that streamflow data alone will not be enough to uh, calibrate the models. A systems thinking approach is therefore demanded to focus on the system as a whole and how the parts actually integrate together. So what knowledge is needed from a policy perspective is that we feed the climate simulations into both the hydrology and hydraulics models, which then allow us to look at floodplain mapping. But instead of stopping there, we can actually integrate ecological and socioeconomic impacts using integrated water resource management modeling. And from there, integrate uh, science-informed policy decisions into um, the sensitivity analyses that we do from the hydrologic models. So for example, socioeconomic impacts of climate change involve a human decision. That is not well represented, if at all, within the hydrologic models. But if we make a different choice in terms of where we put a culvert or a dam, um, then that will affect the temperature of the flow and the downstream ecological thresholds and minimum and maximum flows, which could have socioeconomic impacts that would then change the policies and decisions that we might make. Of course, there's going to be uncertainty in any modeling chain. And as we add more complexity, there's gonna be even more uncertainty. So how do we deal with that? 
We can use isotopes to help support the next generation of decision-making and policy um, because the accuracy of the models and predictions, of course, is a huge risk to operations. Isotopes, as I've shown, can help to highlight the model structure errors and improve the model calibration, which improves the reliability of the model outputs. Plus, we then subject our models to more testing, which actually increases the perception of accuracy as well. Isotopes are also enhancing the amount of data and observations that we have uh, globally, not just in Canada, and opening up new data analytics possibilities as well for things like machine learning. Because isotopes tease apart processes, we can often detect changes in the hydrological processes using the isotopes long before we actually uh, see a total change in stream flow. This then acts as an early warning for managers and an identification of hotspots of change that can link to biodiversity stressors. Isotopes also offer more evidence and more justification for decision makers um, in terms of uh, providing more data to um, and additional evidence to help support the decisions. Over the past year, my team has also worked with InnoTech Alberta to develop an interactive dashboard to help uh, make isotope data more accessible to practitioners. Um, the ISO ABMI dashboard is shown here and is a development of a visual interface to help display isotope data. So the functionality includes spatial mapping of isotope data that were collected under the ABMI program. And you can click on an individual site and then see where that site falls relative to the rest of the data in an isotope framework space. You can also use interactive toggles for different hydrologic processes and water balances, such as E over I, Q over I, groundwater over inflow, and groundwater over surface water, in order to display sites within a particular range of any uh, water balance indicator. And last, you can also scale by watershed characteristics. So here I'm showing water yield, but we also have drainage area, lake area, and mean depth as scalable maps that can be used where you can see the isotope framework and the individual isotope sites as well. So to sum up, the increased frequency of extreme events must be accounted for in our models and modeling methods. This demands a more complex and process-based approach, which will uh, improve our, require us to improve our observations that we use to tune our models. Advances in large-scale tracer-aided modeling can help with methods that provide information on process partitioning within the models to improve our prediction of extreme events. Expanded modeling chains that look at uh, the downstream consequences of water balance change is, are very important to help inform policy and decision makers. But to get there, we need to focus on developing user-friendly tools and open source models and codes and workflows that make this all accessible to non-isotope experts. So the moral of the story is that uncertainty will always prohibit models from being exactly correct, but large-scale tracer-aided modeling offers the opportunity to detect this uncertainty and to move it from being a threat to an opportunity for informed decision-making. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Stadnick. Um, excellent presentation. A reminder to folks online, we're compiling questions. We'll have about uh, 20 minutes at the end for a Q&A discussion as well. So uh, I'll turn things over now to Francisco and John, if you could begin sharing your slides and unmute, please. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Francisco and I are going to share uh, um, with you uh, this case study um, that applies isotopes to um, demonstrate water balance changes in a network of lakes in northern Alberta. And we've been looking at this, we've been monitoring these lakes for two decades, and we do see very significant trends. And um, I'd just like to uh, tell the story of these lakes. Um, what um, we interpret is happening here is uh, degradation of permafrost, so it's thawing, and additional water is being uh, uh, generated from this uh, from the storage of that was once in permafrost, and it's flowing to these lakes, and. Across the region, the lakes are all in a different stage of, of uh, 
progression in this permafrost thaw. We call it the thaw trajectory. And uh, just here on the on the front page is a picture of frozen uh, soil uh, in a core that we collected near Namur Lake. Um, I'm not uh, able to advance. Hang on. There we are. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about water, uh, water availability trends in Alberta, um, and then show that a lot of these trends, or at least the ones in, in the north, are not explained by the precipitation and uh, uh, evapotranspiration trends. Um, so they're not directly uh, driven by uh, changes in these processes, but rather by permafrost thaw. And the, the network of lakes, it's a, a group of 50 lakes, and uh, RAMP stands for Regional Aquatic Monitoring Program. The network was originally set up to monitor acid rain and deposition, but um, we see some interesting patterns that, that don't support that acidification is happening. And, and part of the reason is because of the influence of permafrost thaw. So it's a, it's a case study that uses isotopes to trace changes in water balance and also to look at uh, the changes in the geochemistry of these lakes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about those isotopic trends, uh, some of the evidence of permafrost thaw and uh, some of the, the implications of that. And Francisco is going to talk a little bit about the geochemical processes that are affected by this. Um, this photo here is just from Google Earth, and it's uh, it shows thos collapse fens adjacent to Namur Lake, which is in the Birch Mountains. And what is happening here is that it's a, a bog plateau as per the cross section at the bottom, which is collapsing. And when, when you get early collapse, you get uh, sort of pock marks or scars um, that are internal within the bog, but once they coalesce, they form uh, collapsed fens, and these can transport uh, material, nutrients, carbon to, to the lakes, and they change the geochemistry, and they, they change the water balance. So uh, in terms of water yield, um, this is a very recent publication uh, specific to Alberta that was compiled um, and just released this year. And... Uh, Newton and Taub here, they show the water yield trends for different watersheds across Alberta. Now, the most prominent trends that you see are that alpine watersheds in the south are shedding more water. They show positive trends. And this is over the period from 1976 to 2015. Um, the, the, there are some declining, declining trends in the north. And uh, if we look here in the far north, in the lower Athabasca region, we see purple. That is the, the steepest uh, increase in water yield anywhere in the province over, the, over that 40-year period. And um, I'm going to try and uh, convey it that to you that this is likely due to permafrost thaw. If we look at the climate data for the same time period, and I highlight it here in red and show it these arrows, it's it marks, this is for Fort McMurray, which is a nearby weather station uh, in the lower Athabasca. It, it clearly shows a, a, a wet to dry transition during that 40 year period. And uh, also, uh, uh, looks like a decrease in precipitation over that interval. This does not explain increase in stream flow. The process that we attribute the changes to is permafrost thaw. And this is observed in the field um, at these 50 lakes. We show here in the left panel just a map of permafrost zones in Canada. We're, we're looking at a region here, which is right on the southern uh, uh, boundary of the permafrost zone, you know, sort of uh, sporadic and isolated 
permafrost is present most of the time it's within bogs and and uh, it's the peat that's very insulating that uh, protects it and and allows uh, frozen conditions for more than one year that's the definition of permafrost so we have these lakes um, in different groups there's six subgroups they're colored differently in the middle plot here and they range from the stony mountains in the south uh, all the way to the caribou mountains in the north and you can see uh, one characteristic this is sort of exaggerated topography but it it highlights the the upland like we, these are plateaus that are are lined by shale and they're they're quite impermeable and they tend to have permafrost in the north but in the south the stony mountains is more or less already thawed so it's a it's a permafrost thaw trajectory that has occurred over a long period of time since the the little ice age that's a, a cold period that occurred between about 1300 and 1850 now here i show aerial view of the of the collapse features and some of the collapsed bogs. These are early stages. They form these little pop marks, and later on they form these collapsed fans. So um, just to give you an idea, we're looking at a network of 50 headwater lakes. They vary in size, but uh, they're mostly less than one square kilometer and they're wetland dominated. So more than 50% of the watersheds are, are either bogs or fens or open water. And some of the lakes are complex, others are, are fairly simple, but uh, we've been monitoring these for two decades and looking at changes over time. So in each watershed, we went in and we, we did very careful mapping using air photos. We, we know the distribution of land cover and we know the boundaries, the, the uh, watershed boundaries we we measured the bathymetry of the lake we know the volume and then uh here's just a plot showing by subregion that we have variations in uh, percentage of upland fen bog and permafrost now these are the are the major features you can see some regions have you know uh some subregions have up to 80 percent uh permafrost by land cover percentage if you organize them into uh, different categories, we see three main types of lakes. We see fen-dominated uh, lowland lakes, we see fen-dominated plateau lakes, and we see bog-dominated plateau lakes. And um, fens tend to have more groundwater uh, uh, influence, um, and bogs tend to have a lot less. And what we see is that the fen-dominated plateaus seem to be areas where permafrost is already thawed. And the lowland uh, fen-dominated, they tend to be mostly uh, permafrost-free. So for our analysis, uh, we quantified the uh, weather variables across our network using the uh, uh, North American reanalysis data set. And so we we developed time series over uh, the period. This is a 16 year uh, data set that we interpreted. And we, we have a record of temperature, uh, relative humidity, precipitation and evaporation for each site. So this is information that's included in our, in our isotope balance model, which I'll show you in a sec. The isotopic data is quite interesting. It, uh, it um, sort of mirrors what Trish was showing for our ISO ABMI network. We have uh, the lakes are falling on an evaporation line, which is this is very characteristic of open water evaporation loss. It's uh, it's distinct from precipitation patterns or input patterns, which uh, I show here on a separate plot. So we have a contrast between input and and lake water that we can use to, to tell us how much water is being lost by evaporation at each site. And we can track it over time and use that to solve uh, the water budget. Here's uh, the same uh, O18 data. So that's just the one dimension. 
but it's showing that the progression over time for each subgroup of legs. So um, you can see here the variations. Um, we, we put this into an, the isometope mass balance framework and we can calculate things like uh, the evaporation to inflow ratio, so the fraction that's lost by evaporation. We can calculate the residence time of water, so how long is the water in the lake. The water yield is the the sort of, the, it's shown here as the runoff, um, so it's the lateral input to the lake that's not accounted for. So you have precipitation and lateral input. We can calculate the lateral component, and we can develop an understanding of runoff components. So just to show you, here's here's a, just a summary of the, the quantitative information that we're able to uh, discern from, from using this method. And I just show a summary here of some of the basic characteristics. Um, I highlight here at the bottom in this graphic, the, the contrast between two different plateau regions, one in the in the north, which is mostly permafrost uh, bearing, and one in the south, which is mostly thawed, and we see the one in the in the south, we see water yield. So the runoff from the watersheds is mostly less than the precipitation, but the one in the north, the the water yields are are sometimes higher even than the precipitation. This is is the uh, related to permafrost thaw contributions to these systems. So they're getting way more water than they would if they had no permafrost thaw occurring. But this process is not constant. It's, it's something that, that uh, will wax and wane over time. Uh, we, we've determined that some bog dominated plateau systems that are melting can yield over 300 millimeters per year extra runoff. That's that doubles the runoff if you look at those figures. So the, the process that we envisage here is um, sort of like a, a thaw cycle hydrograph where we get uh, early permafrost melt is, is in the category one, and then stage two is when it starts to decline, and then we get stage three and stage four. And we've classified all of our lakes according to, to this category. So we we have a, a way of classifying whether the lakes are, uh, you know, have above average water yields or whether they have below average water yields. That's on this uh, lower axis. And then um, this is the trend. So is it a positive trend or is it a, a, a negative trend? Um, and this tells us a lot about the, about the position on the, on the thaw hydrograph. So now um, the chemistry is also very interesting. Francisco is going to tell us a little bit about the chemistry of these lakes. Go ahead, Francisco. Thank you, John. Um, okay, so um, this, uh, what, what I'm going to present in the five slides that follow uh, is the summary of what we um, discussed in a journal of hydrology regional uh, studies special issue that was published in 2022. If you want to see the more in-depth uh, explanation of this hydrochemistry, you can go to that um, issue. Um, so I'm going to talk about the hydrochemistry of the 50 lakes um, that initially were designed uh, here in the as, as distributed in the in the left-hand side of your screen with the different lake groups like John mentioned before, because they were thought they were acid sensitive, that therefore they constitute what is called the ramp lake. So the regional aquatic monitoring program that has been monitored over two decades, like John explained. Then in this study, we, we investigated the use basic statistics, principal component analysis and lithological evidence and CO2 saturation estimates as uh, mineral equilibria and carbon-13 in the DIC measurements to describe and assess the controls on the pH because what we see, as you can see in the right-hand side top 
uh, you see the trend of the pH uh, that is increasing in a sigmoidal shape with the alkalinity. That trend seems to be flattening around the pH around eight and when the alkalinity is reaching approximately 800 micro equivalents per liter. Uh, th th this is uh, very interesting because, uh, as you can see in the right-hand side uh, 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 diagram, uh, in the pH, in the in the y-axis, and the the time uh, on the on the x-axis, you see that there is a trajectory to increasing the pH with time. So that's what the question we're asking: Why? What me hydrochemical mechanisms could explain the increase, continuous increase in the in these pHs with time? So, um, well, the first. Uh, component that we uh, see we you could envision that we we were leaning towards understanding the, the, the if the alkalinity was having an impact on the pH it was the most obvious uh, explanation so we went to uh, investigate the ion balances in these uh, these waters and we found out that the around the majority of these waters have a deficit in the in the in the anions, uh, uh, so leaning more towards the, the cations. Uh, and then we identified that they, probably there was uh, some negative ionic charge missing. Um, but, well, the, the explanation here is that the, the organic um, um, carboxylic acids in the ionic form probably are great contributors to the ion balances when we compensate it with the organic um, 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 carboxylic uh, ions, the majority of these waters went within the acceptable ion balance errors. So we uh, that confirmed that the, the organic matter uh, associated to the um, dissolved organic matter associated to the water of these lakes is, a, is an important component in the ion balances. The next, please. So uh, when we plotted the chemistry in a simple box uh, diagram, we observed that um, that these lakes in general, uh, in general have a, a carbon, a calcium bicarbonate composition, and then in some lakes uh, where we see the the uh, orange arrow in your screens at the bottom, you can see the carboxylic acid component as part of the uh, imbalances. So in some in some groups of lakes, the ion, the carboxylic acid play a significant role uh, more than in others. And that's associated to what John was explaining that about the permafrost melt connected to the dissolved organic matter. So uh, the permafrost melt is injects an additional um, dissolved organic um, component into the acid water that makes uh, up uh, the uh, missing ions in the ion balances. Also, we've identified that um, these waters uh, have an important component in terms of color. So the um, some of them with less color and a low pHs are associated to um, some some lakes with more permafrost melting and associated to what uh, John mentioned that the, the box that they have more surface water component, whereas those with with a high car um, carbon uh, so high colors are associated probably more to a, a groundwater component. So uh, next. So the other uh, technique that we use to explain the the uh, hydrochemical process occurring in these lakes are the um, what is called the PCA multivariate statistical analysis that we apply to identify the relationship between the pH and other physical chemical components between the individual lakes. So as you can see in this graph, most of the lakes in the vertical axis is a, is a positive value, whereas in the uh, in the lower part of the y-axis is negative. So the most positive values are leaning towards um, color, nutrients, turbidity, total suspended solids, and ammonia. Uh, and, and then in the right-hand side, where if you see positive values in the PCA, in the principal component one, the majority, the top lakes show a, a consistency with the pH is associated to the dissolving organic carbon, the alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, and TDS. So this intuitively will lead us that they confirm that the alkalinity is a major component 
carbon control in the pH, and also the the the, the solution of uh, carbon is are control is a major process in this in this um, in these lakes in these different groups. Um, in in to to highlight here is the the ion the chloride uh, ion that is conservative, and in some in the top group is is the the chloride seem to be aligned with the um, the total suspended solids, turbidity, and uh, ammonia, uh, and color, um, and less associated to the dissolution, potentially dissolution of carbonatic rocks. Um, in the whereas in the lower groups, they, they, the the chlorides seem to be at least in the two groups on the left hand side in the bottom part of your graph, you will see that chloride is aligned with the alkalinity, and then. Um, with the calcium magnesium, which means that more likely the rocks that dissolve in these systems are have a, a, a component of salt component, and, and and we have seen also in this region that some lakes and and some natural springs have high saline waters, which is a, a also reflected in some of these lakes uh, in, in the particularly in the northeast of Fort McMurray group, that is the great side on your left-hand side, the northeast, and the um, Estonian mountains. So the next, next. And, and then finally, when, they, when we look into the isotopes carbon-13 in the DIC in the right-hand side, you will see a trend increasing your, your, your values in the carbon-13 in the DIC with respect to the saturation index of calcite derived from, from applying um, equilibrium modeling to these waters. So there is a correspondence between the, the calcite um, dissolution and precipitation and, and the positive values of the carbon-13. On the left-hand side, you see the saturation is of calcite in, in, in similar fashion in correlation with the alkaline values. Basically, the, the, this confirmed, this graph confirmed that the, the, the solution of carbonates is a major component that is playing along with the dissolution of organic matter. The, in the circles, in the black circles in, the, in your right hand side, you will be able to see which lakes are trending with the high values of uh, saturation index of calcite. And these values have high, um, high um, or oh, in excess in, in CO2, um, dissolved CO2, which means that this, in these lakes you have um, high pHs, um, precipitation of calcite. Uh, and high values, positive values of carbon-13 in the DIC. However, we also observe that some in some of these lakes, the, the, it's difficult to differentiate in the carbon-13, what is, what is calcium carbonate and what is the result of methanogenesis? And we as we suspect that methanogenesis is also occurring in this system, but is is we need to do uh, more investigation with regards to the, that process because there are, there are compounding effects here in the in the right hand side in the graph. So finally, my um, the next the, the last slide of this where we will say that the, as a summary, the hydrochemical processes that are important for the round lakes that are reflective of climate change are related to carbonate dissolution, organic carbon dissolution, CO2 dissolution, and methanogenesis. There are some unknown temporal effects in, in, in these lakes that are primarily reflected in the atmospheric CO2 concentrations that are based locally, because we know that there's, there is some CO2 emissions in this region, and also the chemical input from allochthonous sources and most importantly, perhaps, is the reduced ice cover caused by a spring and summer pHs increases associated to climate warming effects on the CO2 storage under, under ice. That, that's, that is a very important to highlight because our samplings were uh, always collected during the um, after melting, so we don't have samples collected over the winter under the ice. So um, if the CO2 get like a, in the gram diagram in the schematics on the right hand side, the CO2 get increased and is stored during the snow and ice period with these, uh, these um, lakes get frozen and capped with ice, 
then as soon as the um, the summer comes, this uh, CO2 is um, exhaust to the atmosphere and most likely the pHs are going to increase. So we need to um, research a little bit more and, and then in selected lakes, um, collect winter samples, and then that will help us to, to understand the, the CO2 effects over the, the winter to summer uh, lake turnover. So there's all that way I have, uh, John. Uh, I think you have a few more slides to go. Sure, sure. I just wanted to uh, briefly summarize. Um, the headwater lakes tell us a lot about, uh, about the uh, impact of permafrost off and on changes in, in uh, ice cover and so forth and changes in CO2 are, are part of that story as Francisco mentioned. But the lakes display a range of, of, of water yield conditions. I showed you the, the way we classified. There's four categories generally. Um, either uh, they're on the front end of, of just initially melting or thawing, or they are uh, further along, um, depending on, on these categories here. Um, so this is just a framework that we've used. I, I'd like to talk about uh, the implications of the water availability of the water yield trends in the rivers um, after this, but I'll just summarize the headwater lakes first. Um, pH is increasing in 46 of these 50 lakes over the last two decades. So this is exactly the opposite of what we thought when uh, we thought these lakes might acidify due to um, acid emissions, but there, because of the, the influence of things like permafrost thaw and changes in lake cover, they are in fact increasing in pH. We suspect that uh, surface groundwater interaction due to bog fen collapse is a major part of this. We can observe that um, happening. Uh, pH appears to be linked to the meltwater cycle and it may actually decline once the permafrost uh, thaws more significantly. And we're talking about a lot of water. This can double the, the water yield from a watershed uh, for a number of years. We're not sure how long exactly, uh, but we're, we're continuing to monitor. The fen-dominated watersheds, we believe, are either post-thaw or in the advanced stages of, of thaw. So in terms of rivers, I showed you the, the purple area here, the highest um, upward positive trend in water yield. We believe that that suggests that during the 40 year period from 1976 to 2015, uh, we were still on the high, on the high side of, of uh, melt and maybe in stage one or on the rising limb but that eventually we're going to go into a situation where the water yields are going down and down. This is, this is going to happen in the alpine regions as well, where they're, they're uh, positive over the 40 years up to 2015. They're certainly going to wane over time and uh, less water availability is going to be the result. So that's going to change not only the the flow regimes, but also the, the geochemistry as we've, we've shown. So um, we must anticipate this and it's one of the, you know, one of the direct sort of impacts of, of climate change on our water resources in Alberta. So as Francisco mentioned, we, we plan to do further field-based research to better understand the, the trajectory of climate change across the entire uh, region of, of Northern Alberta. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. Thank you, Francisco. Um, so uh, we're rounding third to borrow a term from baseball and I'll turn it over to Bernhard Mayer. Thank you, Mark. So my role is in the last 20 minutes of this presentation series to talk about groundwater. And I entitled this uh, presentation, Determining the Sources of Contaminants and the Age of Groundwater in Alberta Aquifers Using Isotope Techniques. And before I start, I want to acknowledge a number of co-authors from various institutions in Alberta 
and from universities in the United States and in Switzerland who have contributed to this work. Providing sufficient and sustainable amounts of high quality water is of key importance for Alberta's economic future development. Where surface water is not accessible or where it is fully allocated, such in the southern part of the province, groundwater constitutes an alternate source of clean water. But one of the key questions we need to answer is to what extent can groundwater be used to supplement the availability of high quality water under various climate change scenarios. Now the knowledge about groundwater in Alberta <clears throat> and uh, the age of uh, groundwater and its quality, it's still somewhat in its infancy. Key questions which need to be answered are what natural processes control groundwater quality? Are there any noticeable anthropogenic impacts we can observe in the groundwater today? And most importantly, how old is the groundwater? Because the answer to that question will tell us how much groundwater can be sustainably pumped without negatively impacting groundwater quantity and groundwater quality, considering climate change scenarios. So the objectives of my short presentations are to summarize the current understanding of groundwater quality in Alberta on a province-wide scale, to briefly review the occurrence of select groundwater constituents such as sulfate and nitrate and show how stable isotope analysis can reveal the sources or the fate of these contaminants. Then discuss approaches to estimate the age of groundwater using radioactive isotopes. And the goal of all of this research is to ensure sustainable use of groundwater under various climate change scenarios. So in order to achieve these goals, we use in principle three different methodological approaches. One of them is simply determining the water chemistry that includes pH values, dissolved oxygen, redox potential, the concentrations of major cations and anions, the concentrations of nutrients such as nitrate and phosphate, concentrations of minor and trace elements such as fluoride, manganese, arsenic, and others, and where available also the concentrations of dissolved and free gases, such as methane and ethane in groundwater. This analysis is used to determine the salinity, the water types and the redox state of groundwater in the subsurface. <clears throat> A second tool we are using is the analyzing the stable isotope composition of various compounds, such as water, DIC, nitrate, sulfate, methane and ethane, in select groundwater samples, which are typically obtained from the groundwater observation well network. On these compounds, for instance, nitrate, we always analyze the isotopic, isotopic ratios of the two most abundant isotopes. And the diagram you see on the left-hand side shows you delta 15N values and delta 18O values of nitrate. And what you can see is that nitrate from different sources, such as precipitation, nitrate from inorganic fertilizers, nitrate from soil nitrogen, or nitrate from manure has distinct and different isotopic compositions. And we can use these tools to determine the sources of dissolved constituents in groundwater. The third tool we use is radioactive isotopes to determine the average age of groundwater. In order to do that, we use environmental radioactive isotopes such as tritium, carbon-14, chlorine-36, and krypton-81 on very few select samples. For all these radioisotopes, if we know the initial concentration and we know their half-life times, we simply need to measure their concentration in groundwater and then can determine the age of the groundwater. So for tritium, the half-life time is 12.4 years, and we can date groundwaters as old as 70 years old. For carbon-14, the half-life time is 5,730 years, and we can date groundwaters as old as 40,000 years. And if groundwaters are older than that, we move to Krypton-81, which has a half-life time of 229,000 years. And this trace allows us to date groundwaters as old as 1 million years old or more. In Alberta, groundwater samples for water quality assessment 
have been collected by various government um, <clears throat> organizations for many decades. What we have done over the last 10 years is we have amalgamated the groundwater quality information from five major sources and conducted a rigorous quality assessment and quality control analysis. That has resulted in 131,000 groundwater samples with groundwater quality information distributed across Alberta. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, you see the townships of Alberta distributed, and the color in the townships indicates how many groundwater samples we have with high quality groundwater information. <clears throat> what we can use this information for is determine the salinity of groundwater or the total dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids is simply the sum of all major cations and major anions allows us to indicate the salinity of the groundwater. And by looking at all our samples, we found that about two thirds of the groundwater in Alberta has less than a thousand milligrams per liter. One third of the groundwater in Alberta has total dissolved solids ranging from a thousand to 4,000 milligrams per liter. And only 1% of the shallow groundwater in Alberta has more than 4,000 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. <clears throat> and that would be called saline groundwater in Alberta. The diagram you see is for each township, an average depth of the wells from which the water came and the average total dissolved solids. The next slide shows on the left-hand side a frequency diagram of total dissolved solids or salinity for all groundwater samples in Alberta. And on the right-hand side, you see a map with color codes with the average total dissolved solids in each township for groundwater in that area. The only thing I want you to see is that the blue colors are all distributed on the left-hand side. So low TDS occurs mainly in the western foothills and in a region west of Highway 2. And that elevated total dissolved solids or salinities in groundwater do occur predominantly in the southeastern portion of the province. The total dissolved solids in the yellow, orange, and in the red boxes are higher than 2,000 milligrams per liter. The next question we can answer with our database is what uh, contributes to the salinity? And we do that by determining major groundwater types. On the right-hand side, you see a Piper diagram which shows these types. And predominantly, we find three major groundwater types in yellow, calcium magnesium bicarbonate water, which comes from carbonate dissolution and plots on the uh, left-hand side of the Piper diagram. Then we find sodium bicarbonate water, which plots in the purple uh, symbols at the bottom of the Piper diagram. And quite frequently, we also find sodium bicarbonate water, which has sulfate mixed in, which is a mixed water type on the Piper diagram. The next slide now uses groundwater age dating techniques on the right hand diagram. On the x-axis plotted carbon-14 groundwater ages, and we show the different water types in different colors. And the y-axis shows the ratio of calcium over sulfate, sulfate, sorry, calcium over sodium in the groundwater samples. What I want you to see is that the yellow dots, which have the highest calcium concentrations and low calcium concentrations, invariably have the low ages. We also find tritium, in these um, samples as indicated by the crosses in the symbols. So freshly recharged groundwater is typically young and has a calcium bicarbonate water type. And as groundwater ages increase, we go towards the purple symbols where we have much higher groundwater ages, much higher sodium concentrations in the groundwater. So now we have a more geochemically evolved water with elevated concentration of sodium and much older ages. If we summarize all this information for the dominant water types and relate it to the salinity of the groundwater, we find that the young calcium magnesium bicarbonate groundwater has the lowest salinity with on average 400 milligrams per liter. The more evolved sodium bicarbonate groundwaters have increased salinity with 800 milligrams per liter. If we move towards the sodium bicarbonate sulfate water type, 
We have a yet higher salinity in the groundwater of an average 1300 milligrams per liter. And if we move to sodium sulfate groundwaters, we see even higher salinity in the groundwater, now exceeding 2000 milligrams per liter on average. This importance of sulfate to contribute to the salinity prompted us to have a more detailed look at the distribution of sulfate in groundwater in the province of Alberta. On the left-hand side, you see a frequency diagram showing you the concentrations of sulfate for all of our samples. And on the right-hand side, again, we show average sulfate concentrations in a given township, one average value per township. Sulfate occurs everywhere and often contributes significantly to the total dissolved solids of the groundwater. The water quality guideline recommends that drinking water should have less than 500 milligrams per liter of sulfate. But our analysis has shown that about 22% of all groundwater samples in Alberta exceed that level of 500 milligrams per liter. And especially on the right-hand side in the southeast corner of the province, you see a lot of yellow and orange and red um, squares indicating that there are numerous townships which have sulfate concentrations in excess of 900 milligrams per liter. In order to understand where that sulfate comes from, we use isotopic fingerprinting. This diagram is from a textbook. It shows sulfur isotope values on the x-axis versus oxygen isotope values of sulfate on the y-axis. The diagram really elaborates that sulfate from evaporites would plot in the top right corner of the diagram, whereas sulfate from a different source, such as sulfide oxidation, would plot in a very different region of this diagram in the bottom left corner. In addition, we can identify processes such as bacterial sulfate reduction, because if that process happens, sulfur and oxygen isotope values increase as sulfate concentrations decrease. On the right-hand side of the slide, you now see the observations we have made through sulfate isotopic fingerprinting of groundwater samples in Alberta. And especially for the samples with the very high sulfate concentrations, having the large open circles, you can clearly see that all of this sulfate comes from the oxidation of sulfide minerals in the subsurface. So elevated sulfate in Alberta groundwater is almost always derived from pyrite oxidation. And this might happen either in the tills or in the marine bedrock in the subsurface. In some areas, and you see that indicated by the black arrow, we also find indication bacterial sulfate reduction is happening. And that indicates that this technique can not only identify the sources of sulfate, but also identify processes which remove sulfate from the groundwater, such as bacterial sulfate reduction. Another contaminant of interest in groundwater is nitrate because excessive nitrate is a common problem in drinking water and causes various health effects. Because of that, Health Canada requires that drinking water has a maximum allowable concentration of only 10 milligrams per liter nitrate in. Excessive nutrients, including nitrate, can also cause eutrophication in surface water systems. You see on the right hand uh, picture from Lake Winnipeg, and on the left hand side, an irrigation canal where macrophytes uh, kind of um, grow from the bottom and impact uh, the delivery of irrigation water to the crops. In the worst case, this can lead to hypoxia or low oxygen in some waters and fish kills might be a consequence. Because of that, we reviewed our database for concentrations of nitrate in groundwater. We looked at 90,000 records and we found that in two thirds of the cases, nitrate was below the detection limit. Only in 3% of all the samples we looked at, we found that the maximum allowable concentration higher than 10 milligrams nitrate N. And on the right-hand side, you see where these elevated nitrate concentrations predominantly occur. It's again in the southeast corner of the province of Alberta, 
where we have squares with yellow, orange, and red colors indicating that the average nitrate concentration in groundwater exceeds 10 milligrams per liter nitrate in. In order to understand what the sources of this nitrate are, of elevated nitrate concentrations, again, we can use stabilizotope fingerprinting techniques. The diagram on the right-hand side shows you delta-15N and oxygen isotope values of the nitrate molecule. And for the majority of the samples, the yellow dots plot in the field, which indicates that manure is the source of nitrate if nitrate concentrations are elevated. In some cases, we also see that soil-derived nitrate is a source, and the soil in agricultural watersheds is often supplemented by urea and ammonium-based fertilizers. In addition, we see that some data points fall to the right-hand side of the boxes which are plotted, and that is clear indication that denitrification is occurring in this watershed. So again, we can use these stable isotope techniques not only to identify the predominant source of nitrate, which is manure-derived right, nitrate in this case, but also identify processes which remove nitrate from the groundwater, such as denitrification. In the last couple of minutes I have, I want to come back to groundwater age dating and show you an example from the Milk River Aquifer which is a cross-boundary aquifer where groundwater recharge typically happens in northern Montana in the Sweetgrass Hills. And then the groundwater infiltrates into the subsurface and migrates northwards into southern Alberta. The Milk River Aquifer has been studied for many decades, and the flow directions in this aquifer are relatively well, well understood. However, determining the sustainable yields of groundwater has been hampered by a lack of accurate age dates for all groundwater specifically. Because of that, we have conducted a project in the last two years where we try to use refined and additional groundwater age dating approaches. We collected groundwater from the Milk River Aquifer on 20 different sites. They all shown either in yellow dots or as red stars and conducted groundwater age dating analysis. In this case, we show the results for carbon-14 age dating. And you can see that we only very near the recharge zone obtained carbon-14 age dating groundwater data, which vary from 17,000 years for the groundwater to 36,000 years. We also analyzed carbon-14 for all the other red stars locations, but in all of these cases, carbon-14 was below the detection limit, and that indicates that the groundwater must be older than 40,000 years. In that case, we need to move to a different tracer, another tracer, Krypton-81, which provides new constraints on the age of very old groundwater. In the vicinity of the recharge areas, we got results with Krypton-81, which are very much comparable to what we have seen with carbon-14, ranges between 20,000 years and 37,000 years for the groundwater. But as the groundwater moves further north, we now find even older groundwaters, in two cases varying from 200,000 years to 270,000 years. So in the middle of the aquifer, we already have groundwater, which is a quarter million years old. And we have further samples further north, which are currently under analysis. And here we expect even higher groundwater ages down gradient as the water percolates towards the north. This clearly indicates that we have very old groundwater and that infiltration of this groundwater must have occurred at very different climatic conditions way back in the Pleistocene. So to summarize now the key points of what I presented, knowledge about the quality of groundwater in Alberta's aquifers is rapidly emerging. Stable isotope techniques are effective in determining the sources. And to some extent, the fate of groundwater constituents such as sulfate and nitrate, but this can also be expanded to methane and ethane. Recent advances in isotopic age dating techniques have greatly improved the knowledge of water ages, especially for very old groundwater. And it is the combined knowledge about the quality 
and the age of the groundwater, which will be essential for determining how much groundwater can be sustainably extracted in the next few years, in the next few decades and beyond under future climate change scenarios. With that, I want to thank the sponsors of this research, which are all shown here, and you for your attention. And I turn it back to Mark. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Bernhard. And looking forward to seeing how old the water goes. Um, all right. So we have some time left for Q&A. Um, what I'll do is I'll read the question aloud. Um, and we're still going to look to wrap up um, at 2.30, so we might have to um, be concise in our answers somewhat, but I think we're okay on time. So uh, the first one is for Dr. Stadnick from Tammy Rosner. Uh, it seems that current hydrological models do not even capture daily extremes, and acceptable performance standards do not consider extreme values only overall least squares type performance measures. Have you given some thought to what performance measures and validation processes can be used to better focus on extreme events? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great question, Tammy. And um, yes, we've given a lot of thought to this. In fact, um, there's a publication that came out uh, earlier this year or late last year, I can't remember exactly right now, um, by my postdoc, Tegan Holmes, we looked at 27 different metrics uh, to figure which ones were the most representative for calibrating our models and actually did try to zero in on the different types of flow. So low flow versus high flow. We also have other publications that have focused on low flow separately and high flow separately. There is no uh, best metric. The KGE is certainly best for kind of the overall hydrograph and Nash Sutcliffe or NSE is the best for peak flow or extreme value analysis. And that's typically what we use when we're calibrating to peak flows specifically. Um, oftentimes it's a limitation in the observations or the data that we have that precludes us from calibrating any better to the peak flows. And that's just to say that we don't have a lot of observations of the extreme events. I mean, they're the most rare in the record. I think that makes common sense to a lot of people. So if you only have one or two data points to fit to, then that's all that you have to calibrate your model to at best um, or validate it. And, and therefore the model just isn't able to capture or replicate those events with the same kind of accuracy. Okay, super, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is for John and Francisco. A number of the lakes you have been monitoring for the last two decades exist within proximity of a large industrial footprint of oil sands extraction, which also disrupts the hydrogeologic cycles. Has it been a challenge to distinguish broader environmental change, in this case, permafrost melting with local industrial activity? John, you go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, one characteristic of the lakes is that they're they're headwater lakes and they're they're not road accessible, so that most of the lakes are not uh, really very close to uh, direct impacts, right? So there's no direct impacts in the watersheds. The only exception was Curl Lake, and that lake is no longer monitored. It's now a tailings pond, uh, and it's being operated as an industrial uh water uh reservoir so um we don't see a lot of of uh direct impacts um but of course we we only have limited information none of these watersheds are gauged so we are relying on the isotopic approach to uh to estimate so it's sort of trish's situation in ungaged watersheds we're using the isotopic signals in the lake to detect change. And uh, <clears throat> I would say the vast majority is is not related to industrial development directly, um, if, that, uh, if that makes sense. Francisco, do you want to contribute to that? Yeah, I would say that uh, it will be uh challenging to separate uh, the CO2 contribution um, from various sources. I think at the moment we only have modeled values of CO2. Um, we don't have measured values of CO2 in the system. So that's something to address in the future. 
Okay, you guys can stay unmuted because there's another one here for you. So from Jay White, uh, what is the link between reduced ice cover and pH? Um, John, can I take that one? Um, yes, please do. Um, I would say that uh, the relationship is uh, that the climate change seems to be um, removing the ice cover earlier and earlier in during the year. Therefore, the pH that will be affected based on the CO2 store and the, the ice so will be released earlier and earlier, affecting the, the readings on the pH in, the, in those lakes. I hope that kind of answered the, the question. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, moving along. So a uh, question now for Bernard. Uh, it seems like the groundwater in Southern Alberta is lower quality, uh, more saline. It is also the region where we will likely need to look to groundwater for future water supplies. Can you comment on the potential implications for future reliance on groundwater in Southern Alberta? Yeah, certainly the observation is correct that this um, southeast corner of the province of Alberta has challenging groundwater quality, but this is not the same everywhere. So now having an overview of the quality is, I think what needs to be done in the next little while is to uh, find locations where the sulfate concentrations, nitrate concentrations are not extremely high and find groundwater sources where we have reasonable water quality. It will not be perfect and it won't be the same as in the foothills region where we have um, calcium bicarbonate type waters, but I think there's still potential to look in southeastern Alberta to find the relatively better groundwater and separate it from the more saline groundwater, which is neither good for drinking water purposes nor for animal um, purposes. Perfect. Yeah. And so a kind of a related, maybe add on question. Have you looked at potential links between land use and groundwater quality in Southern Alberta? So you mentioned manure and, and nitrates and other things. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. So we, uh, we have currently a project funded, which will look at the relationship between land use over the last five decades and the evolution of groundwater over time and its quality. So in two or three years, I might be able to present the results here. At this point, we only have sporadic uh, observations where we have uh, several groundwater samples with elevated nitrate and can relate it to manure applications in the vicinity, but that doesn't paint the regional picture. So the regional picture of land use change and how over time it has affected groundwater quality, if at all, will only emerge in the next couple of years. Very good. Um, a question now, uh, I think for Francisco. So uh, can radiocarbon or other isotopes be used to verify the release of DOM slash organic acid as the missing component in the charge balance or is that not necessary? Yeah, then thanks for the question. Um, was uh, like uh, Bernard showed us earlier the different ages for uh, application of uh, radioactive isotopes, radiocarbon, most likely won't be, um, I, I would say that would be less likely to be used to determine the or, or dissolve organic carbon or organic acids in these uh, lakes because it's, it's a different uh, measure, a different age range. Um, other isotopes that we have been exploring, and probably John hasn't mentioned it, we have been using uh, radon as a radioactive isotope in the uh, in the lakes, and then um, there could be other use of, of um, short measure uh, isotopes. Another interesting isotope that seems to be giving a very good indication on this is um, um, tritium and the permafrost. So these are, uh, those two seem to be right. It's tritium, it's strontium, I would say, and, and radio and um, radon. Um, now to be able to um, talk about the missing component in the charge balance, I think the best approach is the, the one that we presented, the, the, the approaches with the carboxylic acids. I, I, 
don't see anything, any other approaches to, to improving the high imbalances. I hope that answered the question. Um, can I just uh, say a, a word or two? Um, to follow on from what Francisco said, I think there, there are a lot of groups that are using carbon-14 in, in DOC to tag uh, permafrost thaw uh, contributions of older carbon. So, I mean, I think it is useful. It's not the carboxylic acid that Francisco is talking about, but it is uh, potentially useful in, the, in tracing permafrost thaw contributions. So just wanted to add that. Thanks, John. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we're getting near the end. Um, if there are any final questions, make sure you get them in. Um, so next question is for Bernhard. Uh, what are the challenges and benefits of reliably being able to measure groundwaters up to a million years old? Well, the challenges are mainly analytical with Krypton 81. There is not very much Krypton in groundwater. And about 20 years ago, you would have to sample uh, thousands of liters of groundwater ex extract the Krypton. What happened in the last 15 years is that a new technology came online, which is called ATA, Atom Trap um, an Analytical um, Analysis of Krypton 81, which now relies on much smaller groundwater samples and uh, Krypton 81 has very little interference in the subsurface and subsurface production. So it is viewed as a highly accurate tracer for really old groundwater. What is the benefit uh, we want to understand is the groundwater 250,000 years old, 500,000 years or a million year old. Because we do pump groundwater out of the Milk River Act refer for irrigation and other purposes, and in the concept of sustainable yield, we only want to pump as much as can be replenished over time. So if the groundwater is two times or three times as old, the water will withdraw probably needs to be lower as opposed if we pump younger groundwater. So that is how these ages will be used to kind of determine sustainable yields of groundwater so that we don't overuse this precious resource. Very good, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, one final question before we close things out here. Um, is there a publication available yet on the age dating for groundwater contribution? Is this province-wide dating? Um, so maybe a question for all, I guess, or Bernhard and, and Joan and Francisco mainly. Um, <clears throat> so if it, this question is about age dating of groundwater, there is, about 30 years of publications on various age dates of the Milk River Aquifer. Uh, the current work we are doing with Krypton 81 will expand on that. The project will finish in March, 2024, and then publications will probably come out after that. So the answer is no, the data showed it uh, just preliminary data, which will be published next year. And other age dates, um, I showed some C14 data. They have been published this year by Ruf et al. 2023, which is mentioned in the presentation. And beyond that, uh, I think there are various groundwater age dates, but there is no systematic approach which would have done this for all groundwaters in Alberta. And anybody else who wants to add on, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, we have published uh, some uh, carbon-14 age dating uh, results from the oil sands region that was contained in a COSIA publication, but it's also, uh, I think it's in applied geochemistry as well. So there are, um, I think, 100 uh, age dates in that publication. I can find that link uh, and post it. Sure. Okay. And uh, all the contact information um, is available as well. If folks want to reach out uh, and be connected to any of the speakers or ask other questions, we'd be happy to follow up. Uh, so with that, I, I'm going to bring things to a close. We're right on schedule, which is excellent. 
Um, I want to say a big thank you to our speakers. Really great presentations. Um, personally, I, I'm exposed to this stuff a lot, and I still came away with some great uh, takeaway messages and, and new information to think about. So I, I hope the discussion sparked uh, some new ideas and provided new information for the speakers as well. Uh, the session is being recorded, and it will be available for future viewing. An email will be sent out when it's uploaded. Uh, and watch your emails for future sessions planned for 2024. So this is our last one for the calendar year. Uh, our next webinar is currently planned for January 2024. The date will be sent out uh, later once it's finalized. Uh, but I can say that the focus will be on hydrogen and water. So an exciting topic um, with lots of buzz around it. So with that, thanks. And we look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Take care. Thank you.